Cellular respiration and fermentation produce energy for cells to use. Any chemical process that yields energy is known as a catabolic pathway. For nearly all organisms on Earth, except chemolithotrophs, that energy is stored in organic molecules. Cells release energy in those organic molecules by breaking them down. In other words, you can think of organic molecules much like riding a bike. Organic molecules with lots of bonds have high potential energy, much like a biker at the top of a hill. Through cellular respiration and fermentation, those bonds are broken, releasing the potential energy of organic molecules into kinetic energy that cells use to do work. In cells, electrons are the most important source of chemical potential energy. The amount of potential energy in an electron is based on the position relative to positive and negative charges. Electrons that are closer to negative charges and from other electrons and farther from positive charges have higher potential energy. When this process is completed in the presence of oxygen, it is known as aerobic respiration. In the absence of oxygen, it is known as anaerobic respiration or fermentation. In eukaryotes, this process is completed in the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion is a double membrane structure that is really an energy producing bacteria held hostage by the eukaryotes. We know this because it contains its own DNA, makes its own ribosomes, and even produces some of its own proteins. But its big claim to fame is that it is really efficient at producing ATPs from sugars and fats. And ATP is life's universal energy currency. Adenosine triphosphate is commonly known as ATP. It is a lot like a chemical spring that gets loaded and moves around a cell and can be split apart producing energy. ATP is then split into ADP, which is now relaxed and has a phosphate molecule. And this is the energy that all cells on Earth use to do work, and it's known as phosphorylization. So during phosphorylization of ATP, ATP is relaxed by sloughing off a of phosphate and becomes adenosine diphosphate. This produces the available free energy which can be harnessed by a living system to do work. This makes it the universal currency of energy for all life on Earth. And in fact, an active muscle cell in an animal can be moving about 10 million molecules of ATP per second. In general, aerobic respiration is the breakdown of food in the presence of oxygen producing carbon dioxide and water and synthesizing ATP. Food can be sugars, starches, or fats. All eukaryotic organisms can convert glucose as food, so for the remainder of this lecture we'll focus on that. This is a balanced equation of the cellular respiration of glucose. A glucose molecule reacts with six oxygen molecules and produces six carbon dioxide molecules, six molecules of water, and ATP. There are three steps of cellular respiration and they always occur in the same order. First is glycose, second the Krebs cycle, and third the electron transport chain. I will describe each of these steps in the upcoming slides. But first, we have to talk about reduction oxidation reactions. These are also known as redox reaction, and they describe all chemical reactions in which their atoms have oxidation state changed. The term comes from the two concepts of reduction and oxidation, where oxidation is the loss of electrons by a molecule or an atom, and oxidation of an atom creates a cation, a positively charged ion. Just think about being a double negative like in algebra. A negative times a negative creates a positive charge. In contrast, reduction is the gain of electrons by a molecule or an atom. Now you got to think about that for a sec. If you're reducing something, you're gaining it. So it's one of those things where whatever you're thinking, just think the opposite. By gaining electrons, it creates a positive charge on that atom or electron. A simple redox reaction is the ionic bonding of salt, NaCl, where a sodium loses an electron to a chlorine generating a positive charged sodium ion and a negatively charged chlorine ion. And this is how living things generate usable energy from energy stored in molecules. Natural gas is chemically known as methane and is the simplest organic molecule. It is a single carbon atom attached to four hydrogens. 
In the presence of oxygen gas and a spark, it creates fire. This is what grills most of our hot dogs on the 4th of July. Two byproducts come out of this reaction, carbon dioxide and water. I bet you didn't think fire could make water, but it does. This is an example of a redox reaction. The carbon loses eight electrons, while the oxygen gains eight electrons. And I'm betting you have no idea why. Well, let's break that down. Well, hydrogen has a charge of plus one, and we know that because it exists in the first column of the periodic table. So when a carbon is attached to four hydrogens, the hydrogen collectively have a charge of plus four, because four times one is four. We also know that the entire molecule of methane, CH4, has to be neutral. So therefore, carbon must have a charge of negative four, because minus four plus four equals zero, neutral. So when a molecule binds to itself, as is the case with oxygen gas, the, tar the charge is zero by definition, because it's a covalent bond. So when methane goes through a redox reaction with oxygen, carbon combines with two oxygen molecules. Since this recombination involves more than one element, we have to consider oxygen's place in the periodic table. Since it's in the group 16, we know that it has a charge of negative 2. So if there are two atoms of oxygen with a charge of negative 2, the combined charge is negative 4. Therefore, carbon must have a charge of plus 4 in carbon dioxide. So the charge of the carbon went from negative 4 to positive 4, and that means that carbon lost eight electron. Therefore, carbon was oxidized. In the formation of water, an oxygen atom combines with two hydrogen atoms and gains a negative two charge. That's because there are two hydrogens with a plus one charge. Therefore, oxygen gained eight electrons. Therefore, oxygen was reduced. For every oxidation, there is a reduction. For every reduction, there is an oxidation and they're known as redox reactions. And glucose goes through the same type of reaction. Each carbon in a glucose molecule loses electrons when it's oxidized in the presence of oxygen. And oxygen becomes reduced because it gains electrons. In this way, energy is released from the glucose in small amounts. Living organisms can now use this energy to do work. In cells, glucose is oxidized through a long series of carefully controlled redox reactions. The resulting change in free energy is used to synthesize ATP from ADP in a phosphorus atom. Together, these reactions comprise cellular respiration. Energy in cells is generated by moving electrons from one chemical to another. In this way, energy in food molecules like glucose are released gradually instead of big bursts. A lot like methane in the combustion of natural gas, NAD plus is the molecule of cells that are oxidizing agents. As glucose is decomposed, it strips electrons from it in order to combine NAD plus with a hydrogen atom, synthesizing NADH. NADH is like a loaded spring, and it has stored energy trapped in small energy doses in the form of single hydrogen bonds and these hydrogen bonds are what create the formation of ATP from ADP in a phosphorus atom. Glycolysis is a metabolic pathway that occurs in the cytosol of a cell and splits glucose into two other molecules called pyruvate. The free energy released in this process is used to form the high energy compounds ATP and NADH. Glycolysis occurs in nearly all organisms, both aerobic, those that utilize oxygen, and anaerobic, those that don't utilize oxygen. The wide occurrence of glycolysis indicates that it is one of the most ancient known metabolic pathways. Splitting glucose costs the cell 2 ATP, but it gains 4 ATP and also releases 2 NADH. You know how the saying goes, you gotta have money to make money. Well, you gotta have energy to make energy. All aerobic organisms take this process two steps further. They take those two pyruvate molecules and break them down a bit further in the Krebs cycle. In eukaryotes, the Krebs cycle occurs in the matrix of the mitochondrion. The details are really quite intricate, but we're going to keep it to generalizations. 
Those two pyruvate molecules that were split from glucose and glycolysis move into the mitochondrion and eukaryotes and get further broken down into several pint-sized energy packets. It produces two ATP directly, but it also oxidizes NAD+, and a similar molecule, FAD+, to form NADH and FADH2. The latter molecules are the star of the next stage, the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain couples the electron transfer between the electron donor, such as NADH, and an electron acceptor, such as oxygen gas, with the transfer of hydrogen ions, or protons, across a membrane. The resulting electrochemical proton gradient is used to generate chemical energy in the form of ATP. At the mitochondrial inner membrane, electrons from NADH and FADH2 pass through the electron transport chain to oxygen, which is reduced to water. In other words, the energy locked up in the NADH and FADH2 molecules from glycolysis in the Krebs cycle gets released in order to phosphorylate ATP from ADP in the phosphorus molecule. So how does it do this? Well, the electron transport chains comprises an enzymatic series of electron donors and acceptors. Each electron donor passes electrons to a more electronegative acceptor, which in turn donates these electrons to another acceptor, a process that continues down a series until the electrons are passed to oxygen, the most electronegative and terminal electron acceptor in the chain. Passage of electrons between donor and acceptor releases energy which is used to generate a proton gradient across the mitochondrial membrane, actively pumping protons into the intermembrane space, producing a thermodynamic state that has the potential to do work. This process is known as phosphorylation, since ADP is phosphorylated to ATP using the energy of the hydrogen oxidation in many steps. The end product of this is a net of 32 ATP, and this is how almost all of the energy of life comes to be. If you combine hydrogen gas and oxygen gas to form water, you'll get a big explosion, a lot of energy released at the same time. However, if you combine them in a stepwise fashion, you can produce energy in a manageable fashion. This is exactly what we attempt to do with nuclear energy. If we release it all at once, we can level cities. But if we release them in a controlled fashion, we can provide cities with a vast amount of energy for a long period of time. And that is exactly what the electron transport chain does. It breaks the fall of electrons to oxygen, releasing the energy into bite-sized bits that the cells can use to utilize the energy. Like respiration, fermentation is a process of extracting energy from the oxidation of organic compounds, like glucose. However, fermentation can occur in the presence or absence of oxygen. Fermentation involves the step of glycolysis and rep respiration but it does not go through the Krebs cycle or the electron transport chain. Therefore, only two net ATP are generated, not the net of 32 that come from cellular respiration. So fermentation produces energy, however it's 16 times less efficient than cellular respiration. As this mountain biker heads up the trail, the breakfast he ate this morning is being burned to power his bike ride. His breathing rate increases as his leg muscles demand more oxygen to burn more fuel. Let's zoom down to where this fuel is burned, our cells. Here, the blood vessel on the left delivers fuel and oxygen to a single muscle cell. In cellular respiration, energy in fuel is converted to ATP, shown here as starbursts. Most ATP is made in the cell's mitochondria. ATP powers the work of the cell, such as contraction. Let's take a closer look at how ATP is produced from a molecule of glucose, our fuel. Only the carbon skeleton is shown to keep things simple. The first step is called glycolysis, and it takes place outside the mitochondria. To begin the process, some energy has to be invested. Next, the molecule is split in half. Now, the molecule NAD+, an electron carrier, picks up electrons and hydrogen atoms from the carbon molecule, becoming NADH. Keep track of the electron carriers. They play an important role by transporting electrons to reactions in the mitochondria. In the final steps of glycolysis, some ATP is produced, but not much. For every glucose molecule, 
only two net ATPs are produced outside the mitochondrion. However, glycolysis has produced pyruvic acid, which still has a lot of energy available. Let's follow this pyruvic acid molecule into a mitochondrion to see where most of the energy is extracted. As the molecule enters the mitochondrion, one carbon is removed, forming carbon dioxide as a byproduct. Electrons are stripped, forming NADH. Coenzyme A attaches to the two-carbon fragment, forming acetyl-CoA. Coenzyme A is removed, and the remaining two-carbon skeleton is attached to an existing four-carbon molecule that serves as the starting point for the citric acid cycle. The new six-carbon chain is partially broken down, releasing carbon dioxide. Several electrons are captured by electron carriers, and more carbon dioxide is released. The carbon dioxide that you exhale comes from the reactions of cellular respiration. Two ATPs are produced by the citric acid cycle for each molecule of glucose. At this point, only a small number of ATPs have been produced. However, more energy is available in the electrons that are being transported by electron carriers. While the citric acid cycle starts another round, let's follow an electron carrier to the next step in the process. Electron carriers such as NADH deliver their electrons to an electron transport chain embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. The chain consists of a series of electron carriers, most of which are proteins that exist in large complexes. Electrons are transferred from one electron carrier to the next in the electron transport chain. Let's take a closer look at the path electrons take through the chain. As electrons move along each step of the chain, they give up a bit of energy. The oxygen you breathe pulls electrons from the transport chain, and water is formed as a byproduct. The energy released by electrons is used to pump hydrogen ions, the blue balls, across the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, creating an area of high hydrogen ion concentration. Hydrogen ions flow back across the membrane through a turbine. Much like water through a dam, the flow of hydrogen ions spins the turbine, which activates the production of ATP. These spinning turbines in your cells produce most of the ATP that is generated from the food you eat. The process you've just observed, cellular respiration, generates 10 million ATPs per second in just one cell. That ATP can power a biker up the trail, or it can power your brain cells as you learn challenging biology topics.